So, um, thank you. So I also do other things beyond this. Uh, oh, whoops, let's go back one. There we go. So just to mention, um, so Media Laboratory, MIT's new Institute for Data Systems and Society, which is sort of thinking about how big data affects society and how you can do things there. Um, I've been involved with uh, GDPR and the creation of GDPR from its very beginnings in Davos and run the, the discussions there for many years um, and continue on as advisor to the UN Secretary General. Um, these days uh, I have this sort of growing ambition, so I'm on the board of directors of the Global Partnership for uh, Sustainable Development Data and Finance, which is how do you measure the state of the world and how do you condition improvement in that uh, state uh, on finance? Because people aren't going to do it by themselves. They need to get kicked. So you have to connect the money to people getting more healthy, more equality, so on and so forth. So that's what we do there. And I've been on uh, founding member boards for people like Google, a still chair, AT&T's big data board, and so forth. So to me, the biggest story out there uh, is that human life has become digital, as it says. Um, when I started really getting involved in international development, a very common way to start a talk was half of the world has never made a phone call, uh, really isolation. And, and it was true. I mean, you could have mass starvation, you could have genocide, and nobody would even hear about it until it was long done. And the change, of course, is that today at least 95% of adults in the entire human population own a phone, two-way digital connections. And in probably three, four years, the numbers will be something like 80, 85% of those will be smartphones. And there's a whole bunch of commercial things that are happening, some out of my lab, um, to make that access uh, free. Got to look at some ads and junk like that, but you know, that will get sorted out over time. The big thing is that access to the entire world is happening in a way that just has never happened in all of humanity's history. Um, along with that access comes data. So people often don't realize, I'm sure this audience does, but your, your typical cell phone has to know where it is so the signal can get to it. So there's location. It knows who you're calling or who's calling you. Do you use text? Do you use voice? Almost all phones now include light sensors. Is it day? Is it night? Um, there are, of course, clocks in there. They have accelerometers so they know how you move. Are you carrying it around? Is it just laying someplace? Uh, there's, there's, in a typical phone, there's something on the order of more than 20 sensors, and that's increasing in various ways. Some of them are directly health-related, like Samsung had one which, you know, when you put it up to your ear, it's shown a little laser into your ear so could it measure your blood pressure. Cool. I mean, you wouldn't even know that that was happening, right? And yet it's passively measuring these things. So they don't require human intervention or human action. The data just exists. It exists for a variety of reasons, to make communications happen, to make it more uh, uh, convenient, and of course to sell ads and do other things that are of uh, questionable value. From a, a science point of view, however, this is perhaps the most important thing that has happened since perhaps around 1800. Um, suddenly, we have millisecond by millisecond data for almost every human on the Earth. We know where they are, who they talk to, how they're moving, what are their patterns, what communities they're part of. We know a lot about how their monetary ecology is, because we know not only where they are, but who they deal with, how they pay bills, because they have to buy SIM cards and things like that. And what that does is, is that can transform all the social sciences, including medical science. So most social sciences, most of the things you believe you know about human beings come from surveys given to freshmen in Psych 101 classes. It's actually true, right? And um, those people are, the technical word is weird. 
Western, educated, industrial, rich, Democrat, I forget what all the letters are, but basically they're not representative of almost everybody. Um, plus, this is survey data, right? I mean, and so in the tests we've done comparing analytic measurements, things that are recorded by sensors to survey answers, um, you often get accuracies from surveys that are around 50%. Like, for instance, we ask people, who did you talk to today? Accuracy around 50%. And these are in highly educated, very intelligent, motivated people who know they're going to be asked the question, and they just don't get it right. <laughs> okay. So it's, it's dramatic to be able to do essentially what Jane Goodall does. Jane Goodall goes out in the jungle, watches apes, and sees the behavior, but doesn't share the semantics and the mental set of the thing she's observing. So she sees signaling behavior, she sees clusters, she sees things that they themselves would not see. And the same is true when we look at, for instance, an anthill. You notice patterns that probably the ants are not aware of. When you get data like this, you see patterns in human behavior that you might have been vaguely aware of. There's probably things in the literature that say, oh, there's this effect. But you get to see how strong they are, how they're conditioned by circumstances. You get to move from an exploratory, is there an effect or not, to something that's actually a predictive science. You get to the point where you can say, here's a situation I can predict with high accuracy what will happen. We all try to do that, but we can't do it in a way that's scientific because we, as individuals, can't see enough samples and note enough features to do that. Now you can. And so there's been a number of papers in Nature, and we wrote one in Science, naming this new area computational social science. Um, and it's not to replace the old science, but to extend it, to make it more complete, more inclusive, more conditional on, depend on circumstances. And of course, in medicine, it makes a huge difference. Uh, I remember being at a conference like this and hearing the dean of a medical school say, we all know that only about 15% of medical procedures are strongly evidence-based. Most of the rest are based on very small numbers or they're traditional. And even more than that, medicine has grown up from this tradition of, you know, the rich person came in the carriage to the little office in London where the hair doctor professor would poke them a little bit. And, and so the classification of diseases, the sorts of evidence that you would gather would be for that type of circumstance, for the clinic, and not for everyday life. Um, let me just sort of illustrate this. We, we took this idea and together with friends around the country, uh, an effort headed by Paul Glimcher, who was at NYU, put together something that would hopefully transform. What we tried to do is build on the intuition I'm going to show you, and this is called the Human Project. So if you look at understanding of humans, all of their research, you know, it's stratified, sociology, economics, biology, um, lots of sub-disciplines, different years, if you look at the actual literature, what you see is this striation, right? So, so people who study genetics study, you know, certain sorts of scale phenomena, not other scale phenomena. Mostly, the things that go across scale are not studied. There's no uh, uh, department of genetic sociology. In fact, such a thing might be deemed to be uh, unethical. Right? although I don't think it would be. But, but the question is, do your genetics depend on your social circumstances and vice versa? There's evidence to show that there's strong dependence between those, but we don't know because we haven't looked at it. So what the idea was for this human project was we were going to take 10,000 people in New York City uh, demographically representative of the city, and we were going to measure their genome, their medical record, their earnings record, their education, their mobility, how they moved around, who they talked to. 
we were going to put little sensors in the underpants of the kids. You have to know, do the kids spend time with each other and with the parents? That turns out to be an important variable in, in development, and we don't know what works and what doesn't work. And we got to the point where, you know, we had all these Nobel Prize guys signed up, and we had money all lined up, and then there were some problems uh, with uh, uh, some of the departments at NYU, and it all fell apart. Sorry. Okay. But being uh, uh, curious sorts and uh, uh, able to sort of work around institutional blocks, we've done a number of other things. So my lab at MIT, as well as other labs, for instance here, um, have managed to collect very dense data uh, from communities. It's not quite as large in some cases or quite as dense in some cases. But let me give you some examples of things that we've collected that I think show a very different perspective on health and on particularly on mental health, which is what I'll focus on here. So um, we had available to us for a while six years of financial data and credit card data for half of the American population. You should go, oh, oh my god. <laughs> uh, and the way that works is we have people who are employed by some of these big financial institutions and by MIT. We didn't actually have the data because we didn't want to risk holding that data. But what it let us do is ask statistical questions about half of the population over years. Um, and um, the answers that we get back were really interesting because the answers were reminiscent of the sort of behavior that Jane Goodall would have seen or we see when we look at ants. So this is a typical uh, behavior for a person. And this is true, turns out, everywhere in the world. Every culture we've looked at, and we've looked at uh, at least five continents at this point. Um, so people, this is credit card data. So these are places where little purchases are made. This happens to be the US, OK? But people will get up in the morning. They'll buy something. There's then this transition that happens shown by the arrows. So if you buy something here, you'll either go back and buy again, or you'll go over here. So this might be the, the corner coffee store, right? And this is the, the gas station, and that's the grocery, and this is the lunch place near where you work. For the typical person, you're 90 to 95% predictable. So that would be an accuracy number. Um, if I see something you do in the morning, I can predict with very high accuracy what you will do at 5 PM and with who. Now, that violates our sense of ourselves. We think of ourselves as being self-directed, exploratory. And indeed, what we are, we see these other things that people do. And all people do this. It's very hard to predict exploration behavior, where people go out and they try something new. And you do it on the weekend. You do it on your coffee break. You just fit it in in little pieces. Everybody does this. This looks a great deal like what's called uh, foraging behavior in the animal literature. You know, the rabbit gets up at 8 o'clock, goes and eats some berries, goes back to stay safe, right? And it does that every day at the same time, except once in a while it gets out and looks for other berry bushes, threats, other things that might be interesting. That's foraging. Humans do this too. There's getting things done, get up and you go through your patterns, but then you begin to look elsewhere once in a while we experience this as curiosity. It's often not in the list of emotions or the Maslow hierarchy, but I think it's perhaps the strongest of our intrinsic drives. People will do almost anything to avoid boredom and explore. And if you look at people's exploration, you can tell a lot about them. So some of the things that are easy to do is you can tell when people are getting sick. You can tell when they're having mental distress. You can tell when they're worried about things because their exploration changes. So banks, when they look at your credit rating and so forth, will look at this habitual behavior, but they don't look at the exploratory behavior in this animal behavior frame. 
And when we've compared it to existing bank methods of detecting financial trouble, things like that, we find we can beat them hands down, often by 50% greater accuracy. Because everybody displays this sort of behavior. And it's actually even more important than I've made it appear here. But let me just sort of explain it a little bit more. Um, so if you look at DSM-5 or something like that, DSM-4, oops, sorry, go back. Um, you get certain things that you're supposed to have as um, criteria for diagnosis, right? Well, those criteria are actually things that you can measure as proxies with what are the sorts of people you talk to? How often do you talk to them? When do you talk to them? How often do you get around? How often do you meet new people? How much exercise do you get? How much sleep do you get? All of those sorts of things show up in your cell phone. How you use this most important sort of interface to the world. So you can actually make a little diagram that says, OK, I'm going to measure these features off of the, the cell phone. And then from that, I'm going to construct proxies for all of the DSM-4 criteria. Now, you can't do this with everything. Not all of the things in DSM-4 can be approximated. But a large fraction can. It's very surprising how many show up as behavioral features that you can proxy using cell phones. And this is a system we wrote uh, and deployed in, in medium-sized things, oh, back, uh, must have been like 2008, 2009, something like that. So we've been at it for a while. Let me just show you an example. So um, a typical thing people would worry about is how much do you move around? So if you look at um, quality of life things, there's these sort of circles of, of behavior, right? You get out of bed, you go out, explore, work, you know, you're, you're the structure of your life. Well, you can measure that by looking at, for instance, cell towers that you phone sees, and in more particularly, Wi-Fi access points that you see. So you can, as you walk around in a building like this, your phone automatically senses every single Wi-Fi point. So I can tell how much you run around. If I have those measurements from other people, I can tell how many people are around at the same time, and if they're the same people. I can look at your habit, habits. Do you do this at the same time, or do you do this as an exploratory sort of behavior? So um, for instance, if we're doing a university population, you can look at how much uh, do they move around within the university, and how much do they move outside of the university. That has to do with how much do they feel like they want to explore their larger environment versus exploit their sur immediately surrounding environment. So these are just measurements. Who you call? How much do you call people? And that could include texting and other methods of communication. Do you do it at night and on the weekend, or do you do it during the day? Turns out that at MIT and in Europe, because those are the two places we've actually done this in depth, you can predict who will say that they're a friend of the other person with about 95% accuracy by that one measurement. And it has to do with, you know, when do you see them? How often do you see them? Are they work friends or, or, or real friends, real like the rest of your life friends? Amazingly good accuracies. Not only that, but these friendship relationships are not symmetric. So uh, if we take a small community, like a high school or a university class, and we ask people, list your top five friends, you find that about half of the friends you list will not list you, OK? This isn't normal. Um, it's aspirational friends. If we do this in a minority community or an immigrant community, it's 75% of the people will not name each other. And this is indicative and correlates very highly with feelings of membership in the community and certain types of uh, aspirational social stress. Who knew? <laughs> and we've done that on most of the continents on Earth. It's, it's a type of foraging behavior that people have that's really, really quite something. 
Even more surprising is if you look at this friendship structure that you can derive, there'll be people where they show this signal of friendship, but weaker than the people that actually name each other as friends. Those are quite likely, more than 50%, people that you will name as a friend six months in the future. So I can predict who you're going to be friends with with decent accuracy. Well, this is all in the, the proceedings of the National Academy of Science, or science itself, or nature. Um, whom you see to say face to face. So it's not just this digital stuff. I mean, we all know that that's increasingly important, but the base is face to face. You can do the same thing there, too. So you can use this. This is an experiment we did around MIT. Anmel Nadan is the, was the student that led this one. Um, we asked, can we predict people's feelings of health or signals of health? So we looked at whether they would say they are depressed, whether they would say that they are stressed, whether they had symptoms of flu, whether they had symptoms of some sort of GI tract disturbance. And we found that we could do about an 80% accuracy at each of those categories and differentiating between the categories. Just, all of this is without talking to the person. There's no input by the person, except when we actually ask them at the end, how do you feel? <laughs> right? These are things that are automatically recorded. It's also not rocket science. This is not like AI or machine learning. This is pretty, I showed you in the last slide. It's pretty straightforward, right? You know, if you're not getting out much, you're not getting out much. There's no machine learning required in there, right? Um, interesting. So this got some people excited. This will save our health system. I just want to explain. He's a, he's a, he's a great guy. He's excitable. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But let me explain what he meant, is that in our health system today, if you look at the costs, plus the demographics that we're going to be facing in the future, um, a naive extrapolation would say that costs in the healthcare system will go up by about a factor of 10. So it'll be 200% of the total GDP. Sort of unlikely, <laughs> okay? But, but we're facing a real problem here, okay? On the other hand, if you could get to people reliably early, you can reduce the severity of the thing you have to treat because you get it early. You could have many, many fewer worried well in the system. And a fairly plausible estimate is you could reduce the cost of health care by a factor of 10 if you could have like a check engine light something that said, oh, you should go see someone, right? So that, that all the doctors and hospitals make the same amount of money, they don't make more money, but you get 10 times more effectiveness out of the system. That was, that's the logic. I'm not gonna like endorse it. Um, I think it's probably basically correct. I won't testify to the numbers is what I mean. What of course would be better is not just to detect things, but to predict them. And so we did an experiment recently where uh, we asked people to record their mood and what they were doing uh, several times a day uh, for years. So we got tens of thousands of people to do this. And you can say, how did you do that? How many people asked themselves that question? Uh, yeah, okay, these are the people who have actually done real experiments, right? <laughs> this was in Japan. In Japan, they'll actually do this. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. Uh, for, for someone who does a lot of experimental stuff, this is like magic, right? People who actually record things all the time. Right? Anyhow, so we got, um, let's see if I remember right, we got almost 2,400 people who were self-declared to be depressed. Uh, and we watched them for 24 months, we took the minimum uh, 24 months on average, we took a minimum of people who had 28 days of complete data. Okay, they had to record their moods um, several times a day, what their behavior was, uh, and then we could give them feedback at the end of like a week or a day about how things were going. 
And we asked the question, could we predict depressive episodes? And the answer is, yeah, you can. It turns out that these sort of mood swigs, not, and we're not talking about bipolar here. Okay? These are not primarily bipolar. There may have been a few in there, but this is primarily not bipolar. The, the things that you get ha have a, a, a daily pattern, but they also have a weekly pattern. And so the weekly pattern has to do with the structure of your life. In Japan is structured by seven days a week, just like here, and the things you have to do and so forth. The thing that's interesting is the area under the curve, ROC uh, uh, measurement is 0.86, so you may not be familiar with this way of doing the statistics. This is awful good. This says that, you know, on the order of 90, 95% of the time, we'll be right when we say, you're going to be depressed tomorrow evening. So that's a really pretty interesting thing. Obviously, there's going to be some false alarms, right? Um, the learnings from this study are actually interesting. One is, is, is that the notions of depression and mood, the way we often talk about it, or at least the way I do, maybe it's just I'm not sophisticated, we talk about it as something that happens to you. Your chemicals got out of balance, right? Something bad happened to you. But the fact that this is, has a weak cycle, a week-long cycle, means that it's more dynamic than that. It's more like, you know, a spring where, or a string where you pluck it and it goes, you know. You can predict when the, uh, the lead and, and, and minimum pieces of that, that vibration are. And it'll vary a little bit as you vary the tension. But basically, it's something that's oscillating. And that's a, a mental model to have for people's mood. It oscillates. It oscillates res in response to external circumstances. But that oscillation is what makes it predictable. And that's something that I don't see people talking about very much, is, is that it's, it's not an instant by instant thing. It's something that has to do with a homeostatic mechanism that is attempting to maintain homeostasis in the presence of lots of external effects. And it does that with a certain dynamics, which is what makes it predictable. Now, Roz Picard, uh, who works uh, in the same department that I'm in and happens to be a student, she's like you know, one of my, one of, a long time ago, she's, this is not me, um, but I can still be proud of her. <laughs> um, did a very similar experiment recently and showed that the most important single external factors were valence of social interactions, which you might have expected, right? But it's nice to have the data to sort of show that that's something that helps and hurts, these social things. And in fact, I have something that we were not able to publish, but with a collaborator here in Boston, they did a weird thing that's why we're not able to publish it. Um, they took a cohort of people who had a whole variety of mental diseases, and they gave them 28 different diagnostic tests. So you might have schizophrenia, but we're going to give you a depression test anyhow, right? <laughs> Just to sort of look at comorbidity and stuff like that. And being a statistics type of guy, I sort of asked, well, out of all these hundreds of questions, what are the most important? And the most important ones is, do you have people you talk to regularly? And do you have people that you can talk about your problems with? That accounted across all the mental diseases. And this was not a fair sample, so you know, don't take it too strongly. But that counted for roughly 80% of the variance across all the mental diseases in the sample, not just depression. That's interesting. So that argues, again, for this sort of notion that we have some sort of homeostatic mechanism is very strongly dependent on our social interactions and the way we frame things, of course, in those social interactions. And that we can go wrong in lots of directions, um, but if you could maintain that homeostatic median, you'd probably be OK. Obviously, there's some, some disease processes that will throw you off and other things. But it gives rise to a, a rather controversial, I think it's controversial, maybe it's not, 
um, hypothesis here, which is maintaining mental health depends on reciprocal interactions with other people. Okay, so that's this homeostatic mechanism. So you are, uh, and why reciprocal? Well, that's a nod to the sorts of things we can actually measure. You know, if you and I talk, you might decide that it's not so good and I thought it was wonderful. It's very hard to judge the valence of things from the other person's point of view, right? But here's something that does work, at least as far as we can tell, and it's not perfect. Um, if I talk to you, and then later you call me up, and then later I call you, and then you call me back, you've got to be okay with it. You've got to be getting something out of it. And I've got to be getting something, because otherwise we wouldn't do it, right? It may have aversive elements, that's fine, but still it's got to be sort of the integral of usefulness is greater than zero, or you wouldn't do it, not over a long period of time. And that's why I say reciprocal. So reciprocal means an interaction that you're getting something out of. But maybe you can come up with a better uh, definition. I'm not stuck on this. I just want to sort of put it out there. And uh, I heard a talk recently about the, uh, the Harvard Longevity Project, I think it's called. It's the Good Life, How to Live a Good Life. So following Harvard students for, was it 70, 90 years, something like that. And, and the, the primary thing there was that uh, it's social interactions with people that you trust. Okay? So again, that's sort of not direct evidence, but it's like, huh, okay, that sort of fits. Let me show you the way I think about it. Um, and this here, we're going off reservation here, right? <laughs> so I was, I said, I should do something interesting here rather than just show you data. So this is a quote from Adam Smith that's been edited a bit. Um, but he says, we've all heard of the invisible hand, right? The invisible hand makes society work, right? The, the dogma is that the invisible hand is markets, okay? But that's not what Adam Smith actually said. What he said was this. He said, it's human nature to exchange not only goods, that's the money part, but also ideas and favors. And it's these exchanges that create solutions for the good of the community. Now, I will point out that that's exactly the opposite of a market. Okay, a market is a centralized mechanism with clearing that's regulated by a third trusted party. These are peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So he's saying these reciprocal interactions are the things that allow us to discover solutions for the good of the community. Huh. Okay. This is one of those things like it takes days of just sort of thinking about this to actually understand the depth of that. Let me sort of put it in a different way. Evolution selects for individuals that engage in selections of good ideas and favors. One of the reasons we're here and didn't get eaten by the lions is we help each other. And not out of the good of, us, of our heart necessarily. But you learn from me, I learn from you. I'll help you this time if you help me next time. That's trust, okay? Beings that do that don't get eaten by the lions as often, and they don't starve to death as often, and they don't lots of other things. And evolution will select for that sort of behavior. And it's a big active field. I'm aware of it. I know there's little asterisks in there, uh, and I'm happy to argue it ad nauseum because I don't agree with some of the literature. Um, but this is a different way of thinking. This is. Social interactions are not a nice to have. This is key to your fitness and survival. Evolution will cause this homeostatic mechanism, not because it's nice or it's a good thing or you're going to learn a little bit more. It's going to cause this thing because you won't starve to death. Or you'll starve to death less often, maybe. Okay? Um, and there's a popular version you can say mind health depends on appropriate social exercise just as body health depends on appropriate physical exercise. So that's my hypothesis. And I hope that helps you sort of understand it. Let me show you some data. So this is a former student of mine. This is data from every council in the UK. Councils are small neighborhoods. In the UK, they have their own little local government to manage the housing and so forth. And they keep track of stuff as governments are wont to do. Uh, and they keep something called a socioeconomic index, which is the linear sum of 
GDP, life expectancy, crime rate, and infant mortality. Why do they add those three things up? Because they always co-vary with each other almost everywhere, almost all the time, okay? They could have added in a, a number of cases of mental disease. So for instance, the people with low socioeconomic indexes are twice as likely to have clinical depression as people with high socioeconomic indices. And the same is true for a lot of the mental diseases. Okay, so, so there is this like good, bad continuum. <laughs> it doesn't account for everything, but you remember my little 80% of all the variants thing? Yeah, like that. So, so here, that's one thing. On the bottom is a measure of social network diversity. So what this is is within a neighborhood, do the people in the neighborhood talk to each other? That's a number. Plus, how much do they talk to people outside the neighborhood? That's it. Nothing fancy. This is from telephone data. You can do the same thing with mobility, physical mobility, like, you know, from, you know, Google Maps. Like, do you actually get out and talk to your neighbors? And do you, as a community, engage with the rest of it? We've done things in uh, several continents, looking at these sorts of things. It turns out that you can predict crime this way. Not individuals. It's that this neighborhood is in serious trouble because it went down that curve. When neighborhoods go down the curve, crime goes up most of the time. Uh, if neighborhoods go up the curve, it turns out that the following year, they'll make more money. Income is very tightly tied to social diversity. Huh. You didn't know that. I didn't know it. Maybe you know it. <laughs> so, so this is from the whole bloody country. Every dot is a neighborhood. It has an R squared of 0.85. That's like, you know, a law of God or something in social science. This is a little experiment that we did. So there's 130 people, it's married couples, young kids. Uh, we bugged their phones. They knew about it, right? You know, it's all under IRB all that good stuff. And we looked at there, in this case it was calls, but it works just as well with face-to-face -face and texting, almost just as well. Um, you can use all three of them and do even better than this. And, and what we did is we watched when people would interact with each other. So um, if, if two guys interacted a lot, it's about half female, half male. Um, if they interact a lot, there's a strong line between them. If somebody interacts a lot with a lot of people, they have a lot of quote unquote social capital. Don't take that too seriously. It's just, we had to call it something, social capital, okay? Um, but we also, oops, at one point asked them a bunch of trust questions, because we don't know what trust means. So we asked them, would you loan this person 100 bucks? Would you let them watch your baby? This is all sm you know, young families, right? Would you loan them your car, okay? Turns out we can predict the answers to those questions with mid 90% accuracy by looking at the pattern of, intera of reciprocal interaction. You might, th those are the things that are good for mood, right? Those are the things that are good for like moving up the curve so the babies don't die, right? And in fact, we also did an experiment where what we did is we said, well, gee, if I want to change this guy's behavior, and in this case was getting people to get out and around and more active, that was the task. I could assign them some buddies and reward the buddies for helping that person get out and more. And I could make it people that have high reciprocal connections, or I could make it people that are more sort of between the communities uh, or people that didn't know each other. So the people that have high connections like this are four times more effective. You might have guessed this. If you did guess this, then you have to ask, why do they not do 12-step programs this way? 12-step programs almost universally take a bunch of random people, stick them in there. You don't care who these bozos are. It might feel good to say you're an alcoholic, but you know, frankly, you'll never see these people again. If somebody interacts with you a lot, you're gonna see them again, and, and you'd better behave. That's sort of the, a way to think about it. Anyway, so, so you can see that there are communities here. These communities with high levels of interaction tend not to have mental disease the same way other people 
do, they tend to make more money. They have less crime. Hmm. Okay. There's some other sort of subtleties that have to do with rates of innovation. What you need is a community that's tight, but also is connected to other communities if you're going to have innovation. Now, I'm showing you this on 130 people, but I can show you this on, you know, the entire city of Beijing, the entire city of Istanbul, the entire city of New York, or I can show it to you on national scale. You know, the same things hold. It's not, you know, like some special, special thing. Okay, so. If you buy this way of looking at things, what can you do? Well, I hope I, no, I didn't do this. I've started a bunch of companies over the years. You've alluded to that. So Demagi is a local company. It does software for nurse midwives, principally in East Africa and Central uh, India. Uh, at one point, it was the largest provider of software for nurse midwives in the world. Um, also, Kojido, another local company that uh, helps healthcare providers, this is on telephone, healthcare providers and patients not get into fights and does a very good job at it. Um, and the third one is Ginger.io, which does this sort of phone-based stuff, okay? So now you know my conflicts of interest. This is a different community than I usually talk to. But, but the Ginger guys basically were the ones that did the first experiment about and, uh, detecting when people were having depressive episodes and have taken it to scale. I don't know how many people they do now. It's probably on the order of a million people. Um, so they do check engine lights. And the bigger biggest first investor uh, was Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente uses it for people who are at risk. So you know you have congestive heart failure or something like that. They want to know when you're not behaving correctly so that they can give you a phone call. Much, much better <laughs> if you can get early. So, so that's cool. And then they also do something else, which I hope will amaze you. So they are sold as a, um, a benefit, a sort of a premium benefit to uh, employers. So employers, oh, you have this new facility. What the new facility does is it gives you video conference support with a mental health person, including psychiatrists, psychologists, sociologists who are licensed in your state. And the unusual thing is, is that they will guarantee that if you say, I need to talk to somebody, you get to talk to a licensed professional in under 60 seconds. Now, you think that can't happen. But I will point out to you that you thought that it was impossible to get millions of different products to your doorstep in 24 hours and Amazon does that every day of the week, okay? I mean, it's not rocket science. It's this sort of funny math, stochastic, you know, it, it's basically you got to have a population, match them up, you know. From, from the point of view of the licensed professional, it's sort of a gig economy type thing. But, you know, my wife is one of those people. She says it's better than actually dealing with all the paperwork. You might, uh, whatever. I won't go there. Anyway, they do have evidence from small clinical trials that actually being able to talk to people when you need to helps. Sort of a radical, it's one of those like, you should have probably known that before you did the study, but, but it's good to prove it, okay? Just saying, you didn't think this was possible. That's the reason I'm showing it to you. Is it that this is not like some magic, nobody else in the world can do it. Amazon does it every day. Other people are figuring out how to do it. You can do it with mental health, too. Interesting. Um, and Kojido does this. It does this listening to the conversation between the, the care provider, the distance care provider, and the, the client patient, and trying to make sure that they don't get into fights. The main things are very simple sort of signaling things, like if the professional doesn't respond, um, has a long period of silence, or appears distracted or has some sort of incorrect um, emotional response, uh, that causes fights. Don't do it. So, so, so what they do is they provide little hints to the professional uh, about, you should at least go, uh-huh, <laughs> right? Or say, really? Those sorts of hints that, that make it 
make it much more human. The, the problem for the, the healthcare provider is they're dealing with this technology. They actually, this is important, they have a record of this person's behavior. So in the Kojido case, right, um, Beth, so the Ginger case, they know if you've been sleeping well before you call up or as you call up. They know if you've been out socializing in a normal way. They know if you've gone to work before you say word one, right? Because you downloaded this stuff on your phone so that they could have context when they talk to you. Now think about how that changes the conversation. And of course, they try to hook you up to the same person time after time. Let's think about what that could do to the, to the mental health system. Anyway, um, I took too long. Apologies. Okay, one last thing. So we've done this at, a, uh, two last things. One, we've d done this at national scales at several countries, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, in the lower UK, Senegal, Italy, where we've been able to do a variety of quality of life measurements from data like this. Um, that led a couple of years ago to writing these sorts of techniques into the sustainable development goals. So every nation on earth is supposed to be busy trying to figure out how to use this stuff in their national statistical offices. Um, and we're trying to get big financial institutes to to pay attention to that so that countries actually want to do it. The other thing I wanted to mention is, is that a lot of my current work is around handling this data safely. Uh, and so if you go to trust.mit.edu, you'll see what we do. You'll see me with a tie, which is very unusual. Uh, the president of the European Union invited me to go lecture all the ministers of the various countries on how to handle data, uh, which I did, it was funny. I wore a tie. Um, and uh, just last week, uh, Eurostat, which is the official uh, statistics body of the EU, adopted the suggestion that I made. So, so you might be interested. It gives a safe way, safe privacy preserving way um, to share data and gain greater insights. So there you are, thanks. <laughs> Too scary. Ah. Mind blowing, mind blowing presentation. Thank you. That was the, the goal. I figured if you can't shake things up, why bother? So that I'm interested as a primary care doc working with specialists in mental health and substance use disorder and adolescent psychiatry and figuring out how with everything that's going on and all the progress that's being made in predicting mood and be from behavior, how you can make that 60 second response available to somebody who's ambivalent in a, in a pre-suicidal right. moment. That's right. Um, good that you detected that. <laughs> So, so the thing I showed requires you to make the, the self-realization and take the action and then listen to the person. Uh, and particularly for suicidal type things, that's not hugely likely. Um, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, the longer answer is um, if you can predict variations in mood, you can know when um, those sorts of things are more likely, we hope. Uh, and so, you know, there's a lot of efforts underway around the world, around the country to do this sort of thing. Uh, but the fact that mood swings are predictable to a fair degree means that you could have proactive interventions. Right? So people that know you, that talk to you when they think you're likely to have a problem. And you can imagine a conversation like, hey, it's your phone buddy. How you doing? You know you always have trouble on Tuesday nights. I see you haven't gotten out of bed today. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> you know, that, that sort of conversation. 
and and maybe that's a good place to start. Uh, I I don't have a, a more answer than that. I just think that it's interesting to think about doing those sorts of things. Um, Alex, fascinating uh, review of, of what has been done in the field. Uh, thank you so much. Um, just curious to um, hear your views on the other side of the coin, which is the users, right? So we, w having done some similar experiments and collected some data from the people, um, it's incredibly rich, but it's incredibly identifying also potentially, right? And so have, have you done any uh, research that sort of exposes what people think and their perception of this data usage? So, um, I, the, I guess the shortest or the, uh, the most effective answer is um, we were concerned about that from the beginning. That's why I started the discussion that led to GDPR, right, which is that sort of thing. What you find is, is that if people trust the system, right, and the use of the systems, then they often very much enjoy the service, okay? But they have to trust it. How is trust gained? Well, um, trust is gained by having um, a system that's very transparent and accountable. So, you know, you have to give um, informed consent to specific services and be able to guarantee that nothing else will happen with it. You have to be auditable so that people can have transparent, plain English, plain language descriptions of what's being done with the data. You have to be able to delete it or otherwise retract it. And those are the core of the European privacy law. Um, what I would suggest is that HIPAA in this country was a wonderful solution when it started. It's not insufficiently flexible uh, to keep up with the sorts of things that we want to do with data. Things that are in the interest of the patient not necessarily of the interest of the, of the industry. And what that means is basically being much more patient-centric, uh, informing them in a way that they can understand about what's happening. Um, and, you know, you get, you get things that are surprising. People are, people are really suffering. If you give them some sort of um, way out, they're immensely grateful. <coughs> Uh, I, mean, I could tell you some stories, but they would just be stories. Um, the big thing is, is you have to have a system that operates very differently than today's system. And that's what we're doing at MIT, is trying to design that system. Uh, and it's a cooperative effort uh, involving governments as well as large organizations to try and come up with a new way of thinking about these problems, one that's win-win-win. Thank you. Um, so that was great. I'm, it was great to hear. Um, I was thinking clinically. Um, I, I'm thinking there are patients who want to be known, and there are patients who don't want to be known as much. So the ones that want to be known, I'm thinking you could save me as a psychologist with this kind of data, maybe a half hour even in a session, you know? Mm -hmm. um, because I know if they're you know, tired, available, et cetera. And for the ones that, are, that don't want to be known, I can imagine that it would be, they would be constantly looking for ways to not be known and kind of run away, um, and that might undermine things. Have you thought about sort of utilizing this flexibly um, by looking at sort of, pa per, you know, the, the patient characteristics or personality or anything like that? Yeah, um, I think the short answer is we're not that far. Um, so designing something that some patients will opt into in an informed way and enjoy right. is yeah. already a really tough thing to do. Um, we're also interested in uh, providing, how would you go about, even theoretically, providing incentives for behavior change and support? So the way things are done now are, are you know, have their good points, but, but they're based on what I would claim is a insufficiently quantitative understanding of human uh, behavior. And so an example uh, of a very simple thing, and I'm not claiming that this is like a lightning bolt from above, but when we try behavior change, this is to get people more active, it's not a really super you know, deep thing. Mm -hmm. Behavior change, 
assigning people in random groups, it didn't work very well. When we took the people that you, when we suggested people that you interact with a lot and allowed you to pick from that list, right? Yeah. right? It worked really well. Yeah. And, and so there's this notion of trust with other people and this negotiation for new behaviors. Uh, and I don't see a lot of that built into the current system. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's like diabetics can support each other, but not if they don't see each other except once a month. Right. Yeah. right? How do you actually build community that's intimate daily community around an issue like that? I mean, right. I'm just picking that as an example. matters, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. All right, a lot to uh, a lot to digest. So we'll be back here in 20 minutes for the next panel. So thanks, many thanks to Sandy. That was fantastic. Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you.